So all of you know that this is the DFJ Entrepreneurial Thought Leader Lecture Series, and it's brought to you every week by the Stanford Technology Ventures Program and by BASIS, our wonderful BASIS students here. And it is generously underwritten by DFJ, and you can find it online at ecorner.stanford.edu. Today we have a really fascinating panel. This is a panel of folks from Stardex. How many of you in the room know what Stardex is? Great, and for those of you who don't, you're gonna be very educated in a few minutes. I wanna start by introducing Cameron Teitelman, who is the founder of Stardex. It started out as a, uh, essentially as a project that he started as a student here when he was a student in the Management Science and Engineering Department, and then ended up spinning out into a very exciting venture. So I'm gonna hand it to Cameron to introduce the other panelists. Hi everyone, I'm Cameron Teitelman. Uh, Tina, thanks for the warm introduction. Uh, just a couple years ago, I was sitting in your seat, so I'm very honored and privileged to be here. So our panelists today are some uh, very, very impressive people, way more impressive than me, so they'll have a lot more to say than I will. Um, our first is Joseph Huang, a good friend of mine. He was in a very early session of Stardex, the second session. Uh, his company, Wi-Fi Slam, does indoor positioning, and I'll let him talk a little bit more about that. Um, about uh, what was it? A year, oh, he can't say. But uh, about a year ago, uh, his company got acquired by Apple for around thirty million dollars. Um, a couple years after founding, um, these guys were out of the PhD program at Stanford, and so um, I'm sure he'll be happy to talk about his startup experience. And then we have Sita Saxena. So um, Smita was a math and computational sciences uh, master student at Stanford. Um, was in the first program of Stardex, and actually. Went through, and second, went through another program at Stardex a couple years later. She, her first program was a financial advisory company that sold. And then she, well, I'll let her talk a little bit about the other ones, but she re reformed another company and went through. Um, then we have Milt McCall. Um, Milt's one of the EIRs that went through Stardex, and he was with us for about a year. Um, his company is, is really fascinating. It puts the iPad in the operating room to monitor blood loss. And uh, Milt, I'm not sure if he'll say this, so I'll just say it for him, but he was an undergrad at Stanford, and he was a, um, a medical school student. And while he was in medical school, he won two Super Bowl rings for the NFL, for the 49ers. Um, and then he founded a couple of biotech companies, did a few things, like managed the, the venture fund for Stanford's athletic school. Um, and, um, um, and now he's founding this company. I also want to add, that he was a classmate of mine at Stanford yeah. Medical School. So go Mill. <laughs> Great. So let's start out. We, you um, assume, of course, that everybody knows what Stardex is. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what it is so that we all have a shared understanding. Yeah. So at the core, Stardex is a community of, of high potential founders out of Stanford. And as an organization, we organize them to help each other. We do this in a bunch of different ways, and one of them is we have an accelerator program. It's basically a 10-week program where you have to have at least one Stanford founder on your team. You come in, we figure out what you want to learn, and then by the end of that 10 weeks, we help you learn that. We also help develop specific skills that, in our initial research setting up the program, we found Stanford alums did or had learned to be successful. So in the initial stages, when I was actually in E145, which is Tom a class that Tom Byers, who started STVP, put together, um, I went out and talked to around 220 Stanford alums to figure out what made them successful. And out of that research, we figured out some patterns and some skills that they had developed that made them successful and a certain type of network they had formed around themselves. And so Stardex is, a, is an attempt to educate entrepreneurs who are building companies out of Stanford, help them develop those skills and manage the extended network that develops. So let's pass the mic to these other folks because it would be really great to hear why they chose to be at Stardex. Clearly, the three of you on the panel could have started a company anywhere. Why did you decide to take part in the Stardex program? Great. So uh, we'll start with my story. Um, so as Cameron mentioned, we were in one of the very early programs. And so um, we were uh, just grad students, software in, uh, in computer science 2011. Um, and we were in the process of starting our own company um, and, and maybe didn't quite really understood uh, what, it, what it really entailed. Um, and we had applied to Stardex mostly because other entrepreneurs had told us, hey, this is a really interesting thing to do. Um, but once we had got in, it didn't take very long to realize 
this is an incredible, incredible opportunity. Um, and if nothing else, just an opportunity to spend you know, your day to day with some of the other top entrepreneurs from around Stanford um, and future leaders and visionaries of Silicon Valley, I think is priceless. And maybe we didn't even appreciate that enough when we started. Cool. Yeah, so to kind of echo Joseph's thoughts, um, I was, you know, again, I was also a grad student, and I also didn't do my undergrad at Stanford, so I wasn't really familiar with the whole idea of startups. I came out to Stanford and was taking classes, and you kind of get sucked in. That's all everyone talks about, and everyone's like, when are you going to start your next thing? Um, and so, you know, I took a class to learn how to code, and we had a product, and had no clue what to do to start a company. And so we were actually part of Startups' first class. I remember our interview was at, um, I think it was Tresseter. You know, really nerve-wracking. You know, I mean, you have seven minutes to explain your business, and we built a little project in class, and we had to kind of make it sound compelling. Um, but Cameron, you know, was really nice, and all the mentors are really great, and they saw something. And I think that's kind of their job, is to take something very raw and mold it into a company that eventually got sold. And, um, and you know, even in terms of the practical matters, like, you know, how do you structure your company? What are the legal matters? Other entrepreneurs have been through it. What are the pitfalls? How do you even think about fundraising? When should you be fundraising? I mean, these are all questions I didn't even know I, I should be asking myself before I got into Stardex. So, um, I mean, I guess, I mean, it helped me the first time, and then I came back the second time, and it's been just as helpful, and this is a bigger company, so it's been exciting. So my introduction to uh, Stardex really was a little different. I had been in industry for 25 years. I had been in startup companies. I'd been in venture capital, so I was pretty familiar with the whole process. But I had come back to Stanford to do some mentoring at the Stanford Biodesign Program. And ironically, they were short a uh, business student that one quarter. And the, the guy who leads it, Paul Yock, asked if I would actually be the business student on a team. I thought, well, <laughs> that sounds kind of fun. I actually never went to business school, so I'm not sure how I could have qualified for that. But, um, but I ended up meeting the, uh, the co-founder of the company. Uh, it, at the end of the course, we ended up sort of deciding to start a company not based on that, that uh, project they had, but a different, different one he had had going on, and the next thing I'd say a few months later, he asked me one day if I'd be the CEO of the company, and so it's been two and a half years, and it's been a great experience. Um, we were fortunate because he knew about Stardex. I had been around Stanford for years and knew nothing about it. In fact, I had been trying to start something like this in the medical side um, at Stanford, but, but being, a, being an alum and having a bunch of people trying to help me, I, I realized it's really the students that get things done. So somebody like Cameron, it took someone like him to actually get this started. And then I was able to join into it and be a part of it. And it's been a great community. And I, I feel like, you know, I, I feel like I have, I have something to offer some of these other, I'd say, younger, younger students or alumni. On the other hand, many of them teach me stuff. I know nothing about iPads and software and all this. I'm, I'm learning, you know, up to my ears on stuff now. So Cameron, maybe you can help us understand the relationship between Stardex and Stanford. Um, I have to say I've been here long enough that I remember the days when Stanford was allergic to the idea of having any sort of incubation or acceleration programs, basically saying, listen, Silicon Valley is one big incubator. You know, why do we need something like that? So maybe you could tell us about the, how this came to be and, and what the relationship with Stanford is now. Yeah, so I'll start with how this came to be. And I mentioned it, I mentioned it briefly. Um, so I built two companies when I was at Stanford, uh, two completely different companies. One was a private equity company, and one was an advertising company. And I, I learned a lot about entrepreneurship, specifically through the MSNE program. I took E145, I went to all the ETL classes, um, and, and when I was building my company, I found that I needed to learn a lot of really practical things. And I kept kind of hitting my head against the wall, trying to learn it, trying to learn it, and then um, I would go and talk to my friends. Or I'd find some. I'd go to a networking event and find some mentor, um, but I'd still. It, it seemed really inefficient. Um, I got this really solid foundational education, but after that, it didn't seem like there was much support. Even in Silicon Valley, I'd go talk to investors, and you know, to to be honest, Silicon Valley is a, is a great place, and it's a very let's say meritocratic and uh, honest place. But there's still people who will do shady things, and so when I was talking to other friends who have built companies there was a lot of issues they saw in Silicon Valley. So what I did is I did what I learned in Steve Blank's class here, um, is I just got out of the building and started talking to customers. And after talking to hundreds, uh, this theme emerged where after, after a couple years, they finally figured out how to be effective in Silicon Valley. And so the people who built $100 million companies or $50 million companies figured out, hey, if I have the right support system around myself, 
all be successful. And they wish they knew it earlier. And then people who failed would say, I wish I had known how to build the support system around myself. Because when you're in a large company, you can go to HR, you can go to legal, you can learn all these different things. Um, so after talking to them, it was very clear that there was this big missing educational need. And there's this problem where if you could just structure the resources of Silicon Valley, they existed in a, in a, in a certain way, the process for building your company out of the university could be 10 times more efficient. And so the idea with StartX wasn't to, let's say, create new entrepreneurs. It was to increase the speed of innovation and decrease the friction with people who will be, may, they might be successful uh, anyway, but if we could move the needle on people who weren't successful to be successful and then make the successful people even more successful, that adds to solving problems in the world. Um, and so Stanford, the relationship with Stanford initially um, and you can look back in this, you know, people were wondering, why are these guys doing what they're doing? Is this an incubator in the classic sense? Are we going to waste students' time by supporting them um, if they shouldn't be supported, if they should be thrown out into the wild of Silicon Valley? Um, and it was very clear from our research that it was something that was needed. And so, you know, we pushed forward. We built something. We, we launched it to our customers. We iterated on it. And a couple years later, Stanford has said, hey, like, this is great. This provides a lot of value to our community. And so initially, we were legally separate from Stanford University as part of the student government. And then after a couple years, we spun out of the student government as a legally separate entity. And we set a lot of relationships on campus. And then earlier this year, or uh, late last year, Stanford was, uh, you know, after talking to President Hennessy and the CFO of Stanford, President Hennessy is the, C, uh, the president of Stanford, for those of you who don't know. Um, they decided that they want to financially support us to help us grow even further. So now they're giving us around a $1.2 million grant a year and, uh, to help in our operations. Um, and then separately, we have a fund with them. And the fund is a non-discretionary fund that any company who goes through StartX, any participant, can pull 10% of their funding round from the fund. And so, um, you know, I think like any startup, like we consider StartX a startup, we had a, a kind of rocky start where people didn't really understand us, but now we've kind of broken through, which is great. It would be super to hear from the folks on the panel about maybe some interesting example of something you gained out of this. I mean, it's, it's particularly interesting for the folks who um, came with very different backgrounds, right? Either folks who had come out of classes where you were taught um, a bunch of foundational material, or even um, Milt, you know, you, you were a VC. So you had a lot of background. You know, what sort of benefit are you getting from being this type of experience? So, I, there's there's too many great things about StartX to give you one answer. Um, so I'll, maybe I'll just start. The uh, so first of all, you know, we got there, and uh, as Cameron mentioned, we were one of the very early uh, sessions, and so we didn't really know what to expect either. Um, but it only took you know a couple of weeks before we realized this isn't your typical startup accelerator. We had done some research, you know to try to understand what a startup accelerator was in Silicon Valley and, and what really they do. And you know, for example, we would walk in and surrounding us, there were more, first of all, there were more graduate students than undergrads. Right? There are people there using building game-changing technologies in, in very, very interesting businesses. And it wasn't just you know, a bunch of people making Facebook for cats. Um, and, and you know, like, and I touched on this earlier, in hindsight, the greatest value we got was just spending day to day with some of the top entrepreneurs from Stanford at that time who are going to become future leaders and future visionaries in Silicon Valley. And, and you know, we got to, like I got to sit in a chair beside these people every day. But let's dig down into that though. Sure. Did you spend time discussing your problems with them, the challenges? Um, was there formal programming where you were working together? I think it's incredible how much you can absorb and learn when you're both trying to tackle startup, raw startup problems at your desks beside each other. You know, when we had a sales problem and it was just, hey, this, these people aren't responding the same way we thought. And they're, you know, they, they some other, you know, Jet Lord, Game Closure, anyone sitting across the table would say, hey, you know, we ran into that situation. We tried this, it worked well. We tried this, it didn't work well. Um, people had gone through recruiting, people had gone through uh, patent strategy. Um, pricing, the whole thing, company, I can go on forever. The, all the things you really need to do when you build a company, there's just great minds around you. And it's not just people who are there trying to tell you their stories because they're building their companies too. I, I can go on forever. I don't know yeah, if you want to. That's great. 
Okay. That, that, that was perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so as Joseph mentioned, um, Stardex attracts great people. And um, for us, I think it really, at least for my second company, spot on especially, really laid the foundation of how we built the company to start off with. So when I um, sold my first company, I took some time off and I reached back out to Cameron being like, hey, look, I think I'm ready to get back into the startup space. I may do another startup. And so he was like, yeah, sure, come out, you know, check out the new um, Stardex space. And I did, and I was blown away. It was massive. There's so many more teams. Like, as Joseph mentioned, that it was this whole collegiate, you know, atmosphere, which was, which was great to see. And through that process, I found my new co-founder, um, which was great. Again, he was kind of the same stage that I was at, late nights, talking about the problems that we were excited about. And through that, we also found our lead investor, again, another Stardex mentor who really liked us, fell in love with the idea that we were working on, and was like, sure, I'll back you. Put together our seed round for us. And again, through Stardex, we found our first employee and our next four employees as well. So what Stardex, I guess, really serves at is, as is a really good filter for the kinds of people you want to be working with and the kinds of people who can help elevate your business down the line. And also, at the same time, it's just really fun people. I mean, it's very rare to find you know, smart people who are really driven, but at the same time have personalities and are interesting and, and friends. I mean, I'm glad, Joseph, that I met you and that we get to hang out uh -huh. sometimes. Thanks. <laughs> um, and uh, so from that perspective, it's been great for building memories as well as you know, startup. So I can remember the first thing I learned the first day at Startex. I'm an early riser, and I, I got up as usual early to get to work. And I walked in the door, and I, I saw a few people there already. I said, well, I've never been people beating me to work in the morning. <laughs> but I actually recognized these were students that had been there all night long, and they're just leaving in a few minutes. So, so I learned that the, 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 uh, the culture is very different, obviously. But I'd say I thought a great example was I was uh, sitting at my desk, and, and Startex has a bunch of tables, and all the founders sit around them. And it's, very, it's a big community is what it really is. And I was chatting with the person next to me, and, and who was our director of engineering, and said, gosh, we're having trouble with Apple. You know, they have these iPads, and we can't figure out how to make this work. And all of a sudden, somebody turns around and says, oh, we did that last week with Apple. We met with this guy named Joe, and here's his phone number. Call him, and he'll fix it for you. So it's this kind of collaboration community that really makes things helpful there. And on the same hand, I've, I've been working in the you know, medical device industry for 25 years. I mean, some of the companies are, they have a Startex Med group. And so, I mean, I remember having a lunch session one time. We just started talking about the FDA and how to do, deal with the FDA. And I'd spent 25 years dealing with the FDA. Nobody can ever deal with the FDA, but there are some tricks to, to, to working with it, and there are sort of th things that are helpful to know. And so I was able to share some of that. So I think that, that, that whole part of being able to help your co founders is really what's incredible about the place. So I'm curious, Cameron, how do you pick people? I understand that these days it's harder to get into Stardex than it is to get into Stanford. So uh, what's the process of picking people? Because clearly the community folks that you have under that roof is very special and that that's a huge part of what makes it valuable. Yeah, so to preface that, we're a 501c3 nonprofit and we have an educational mission. And so what we want to do is we want to empower as many entrepreneurs as we, as we possibly can. And so when we were initially starting, a lot of the reason why Stanford didn't want, they were allergic to this idea of an incubator, is they didn't want people who shouldn't be building the companies to be building companies. Like they actually, they didn't want PhD students to just do it because it was cool. They wanted them to, if they were going to build a company, to do it because they were really passionate about the problem that they were solving. And a lot of people in the 2000s were getting funded, just, just like money thrown at them. And so they wasted a lot of their time just working on problems that weren't useful, like Facebook for cats. Um, and so uh, one of our core criteria for accepting people is that they have an intrinsic passion for the problem that they're solving. They also have to have an ambition to solve it at a, at a large scale. So motivation and passion are our number one criteria. The second is team dynamics. So we don't just accept excellent entrepreneurs. We want them to be in highly functioning teams. Entrepreneurship is very lonely. It's very hard. A core part of the value we provide, we actually have kind of like an in-house uh, therapist, psychologist, like the D School at Stanford does. Um, but one of the core values we provide is positive psychological motivation. Because a lot of times when you're by yourself coding alone in the basement um, or building alone in your, in your lab, um, it can get isolating. And so um, providing people with a community of peers they can benchmark against, that they can talk to about problems they can't talk to investors about or mentors, and provides a lot of value. So having that core team that you trust, that you love working with, and that complements your skills, 
solves a lot of problems that companies face. And I think Noam Wasserman at Harvard said 70% of companies fail because of team dynamic issues. So team dynamics is number two. The third is ability to build and build quickly. So just like um, you know, Steve Blank's concepts in, in the lean startup, you have to iterate quickly. Even in the medical device, even in, even in the medical industry, we try to push companies for this. So they need to be highly technically proficient in what they're building in order to iterate quickly. So we actually do technical screening and technical interviews on biotech companies, on stem cell companies, on IT, hardware, across the board. And the final and least important criteria to us is the idea. And that's kind of is like weird to people sometimes. Why is the idea um, the least important thing? Well, it's important that our founders, and especially the CEOs, have good strategic minds. So they can talk about the problem and lay out and break down and reduce the problem that they're tackling in an intelligent way. And then when challenged on something, incorporate that and listen well. And so um, sometimes people can't listen, or founders don't want to listen, and they're too stubborn to listen, and that doesn't work. You can't iterate if you don't do that. Um, so they need to be thinking through the idea correctly. However, everyone knows, well, uh, you know, people like you know who understand this space, the initial idea you start with always changes. But it's important to us that the problem they're trying to solve always stays true because they're intrinsically motivated by it. How exactly they're solving it can change. And that's the framework we use. So how long do people typically stay there? I know that one session is, is three months, it's like, is a quarter. How long do people, do they say one, two, three? So do most, you kick them out? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Most people stay one. There's a couple teams that stay multiple quarters. Um, so for instance, our, our medical program is six months long because there's a longer iteration cycle for medical companies. Um, early on, we had a company, um, a great female founder named Karina Pickard, who built a braille labeler, a more cheap and efficient braille labeler. And that was a hardware company. And so she stayed on three sessions because the, the product iteration cycles are longer. Um, so usually we say, well, you can stay on if you're going to become part of the staff and help the next founders. Um, you can stay on if um, you really need help. And then we actually do kick people out if they're not making tough decisions. Yes. But Tina, there's, uh, there's one more. Oh. Um, there's one more aspect about this too, which is Stanford and, and Stardex are these are these communities that are really powerful. And it's not how many sessions you're enrolled in Stardex that makes a difference. It's the connections and bonds you form and utilize with the people who you connect with and bond with while you're there forever that matter. Um, right? And like we're still getting help from people in Stardex today as well as people we interacted with at Stardex while we were there. Um, and I don't think that's ever going to end. So technically, we're in an infinite number of sessions. <laughs> so that's a really good way to look at it. I'm curious about the transition out. You know, is that an easy transition? Does it feel like you're sort of leaving the nest? Or is it something you know, you're getting kicked out? Or is that a really seamless process as you go from being in Stardex to then basically flying on your own? Spend, you want to take it? Or milk? Uh, milk. Go for it. So I'll answer it. So we actually were there a little over a year ourselves. And, and we really felt like it was helpful for us um, but what happened to us is the company got a little bit bigger, and so we ended up needing our own space. That's always helpful, I think, just because, <laughs> you, I mean, that's part of the issue. But I, I think what Joseph mentioned is even the moment we left, you're still connected uh, everywhere from physically you come in and visit and, and be part of it, but, but through the net and things, I mean, I would say we're looking for to hire people. We send the word out, and the next thing you know, we have started people telling us things, or, or we have somebody coming by Friday that's an expert in marketing as we're getting her ready to launch our product from. You know, Cameron sends out a message, there's somebody that's, that's here that would like to help. So it's this constant communication that goes on, I think, that really makes Stardex so different. Yeah, um, and I think, you know, again, um, similar to what you said, the constant communication definitely helps. But even when we transitioned out, I think it was great that we, our office is right beside another Stardex office, um, Stardex company's office. And it's great, you know, we get to hang out still, solve some of the same problems, and the community kind of comes with you. And you know we try to have events after as well and stay connected. And it's been being alumni, is, I guess, is not as different as being still part of the program. You still hang around and are involved. Great. So the community lives on. So can you talk a little bit about the business model? You know, this is a, an interesting. And a lot of accelerate, accelerators or incubators, uh, they take uh, equity. Uh, there, there are all different ways in which this works. Can you tell us about the business model for Stardex? Yeah. So one of the uh, um, let's say what people say is a, a big differentiator of us is that we charge founders nothing. We don't take any equity. There's no cost. It's completely free. Um, so the question is, how do we how do we sustain ourselves? It's crazy, right? 
Um, well, the core idea behind Stardex is a collaborative community of founders that helps each other. And so we, we didn't want to charge for that. We didn't want to put up a barrier to get excellent people in. And these guys can talk a little bit about, about that. Um, and so what we do is we figure out what our founders need help with and, and who they can get help from and go to them and ask them to pay us to be able to help them. And it's kind of a weird, a weird thing. So we have partnerships with companies like Microsoft and Intuit. And on the medical side, Johnson & Johnson, Genentech, and J&J. &J. Um, VC firms like Sequoia Capital is a partner, and Greylock, and DFJ is a partner as well. Um, and so they help us. They, well, part of, the, part of it is they, 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 they believe in the values of our program and our mission, so they want to support. Another part of it is they want to get in front of these founders. And, and so um, we've always been really stubborn and never creating a, an exclusive partnership because uh, we want to have a level playing field for all of our partners. And that's part of our revenue. Um, we've actually, uh, the only, let's say, uh, uh, donation-based revenue we've ever taken is from the Blackstone Foundation. And then we had a large grant from the Kauffman Foundation in the past um, to produce a, a work product. That's half our revenue. The other half's coming from Stanford right now. Um, so what we're saying is we're going to bring in excellent people, we're going to help them learn from each other, and we're going to give visibility to people. And that visibility is basically what people pay for on the partnership side. And on the university side, we're going to say, hey, look, Jerry Yang, you never, uh, Jerry Yang never gave a percentage of his company to Stanford. Stanford didn't own anything. But both President Hennessy and the university had a great relationship with him, and so he ended up you know, building a building here. And so what we're able to do for Stanford is drive donations, through, through basically uh, engagement, and we're, we're able to help them with their fund, with our fund, basically. Um, so yeah, that's our business model. Great. It's working super, well. Super, super. So who is there? You know, when this started, I remember it was students, right? Students could, be, it was almost like taking, a, instead of taking a quarter abroad, they could take a quarter at this, you know, accelerator to work on their projects. Now, I understand that most of the people who are participating are graduates and, and even alumni, you know, so Milt, you know, you, I know how many years you've been out of school. It's the uh, <laughs> same as I have. <laughs> so uh, I'm curious, um, you know, what was the reason why you switched from really focusing on, on students to alumni? So when you say participating, um, do, do you mean like the staff, the, the people? No, I don't mean the staff. I mean the, the startups, founders. the founders. Right. It used to be that it was students, students who were working on companies in their dorm rooms would come and spend a quarter. Now it's folks who are uh, graduates. I, that, I, don't, I don't know if that's exactly accurate. Um, you know, when we were in the program, it was a mix of both students and people who had come out from you know, further al alums of Stanford. For example, in our session, um, there was Lark, who was making sort of a, a, you know, a sleep tracking um, iPhone accessory. Uh, Diffbot was making, they're sort of using computer vision to solve unsolved problems in web parsing. There was, there was a number of people who added incredible value to us personally, as well as to our company, as well as to the communities. Um, and these were already, they were already Stanford alumni when we had gone through the program. Um, and then today, um, I think you still have a mix. I'm, you know, as taking part in the Stardex community events and things, we still have many people who are students, as well as probably the same mix of people who um, have more industry experience to offer. Okay. And, and I'll, I'll um, you know, clarify the initial intention with Stardex. So our first summer, we took people who are currently in school and people who are graduating. And then the following fall, we were wondering, hmm, can we actually support people who are still in school? Is it possible? And through that, we had a company, um, Clear Ear, um, Lily Chung, who, who was spending 70 hours a week on her company on top of school. And she was finishing up her classes, and she just needed some support. And so we were able to help her. And when I was building my companies at Stanford, I was spending 80 hours a week on my company. And so what Stardex really is for are people who are going to dive into building a company. You know, they're going to do it regardless of whether we're there or not. That's actually something we vet for. Um, and because they, they're so crazy passionate about the problem that they're solving that they're going to do it. And so if people are still in school and they're spending full-time hours and working really hard and spending time at, at Stardex um, or spending time with the company, we'll bring them into the accelerator program. Now, that doesn't mean we don't still support other members of the community. Now, one thing we do, for instance, is anyone who applies to Stardex, anyone, we, cap we get feedback from all the judges online and in person, and we do office hours for anyone. And we sit down and we spend hours, hundreds of hours giving feedback because it's extremely valuable. You don't really get that. You go to a VC, you pitch, they say goodbye because we love you. 
It's, 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 it's me, not you. Um, and they don't really give that hard feedback. And so we do that. Um, and, then, and then, you know, what's happened is we, we have that segment that's, that's like leaving the university, working full time in the company. And what we've done is as our brand has grown, we've gotten more and more people later stage. And so the percentage of non-students has grown, but the, uh, the absolute amount has stayed relatively the same. And what we're doing moving forward is we're moving three blocks off campus um, to this uh, 12,600 square foot building um, that the, the person who designed the D school at Stanford is designing it. Um, and we'll be moving in there in two weeks. Uh, and so over the next three months, we're actually spending that doing this thing called, uh, this initiative called OpenX. Um, and we're trying to take our accelerator program, what we've learned from it, what we've learned from supporting the extended community, and open that up to more earlier stage and students. And so we're we'll working with STVP and the GSB and having lots of events there. Um, and trying to you know, focus on saying, OK, well, we kind of nailed this segment of the population. Now let's provide value to more people. We're a nonprofit. Terrific. So in a minute, I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience. So start thinking about your probing questions about Stardex. So I, I, clearly, a huge value comes from the community of folks who are working there. Um, I understand you also bring in a lot of mentors and coaches. Maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, what sort of people are involved in helping and what they get out of it. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So, so there's kind of four things that we provide. One is community, which these guys have talked a lot about. Um, two is mentorship, and we have a bunch of different mentorship structures from serial entrepreneurs who are lead mentors to an advisory board. Um, for instance, on the medical advisory board of a company, they'll have a doctor and a CFO of a hospital, to experts, hundreds of experts, I think we have around 500, that can come in and get on phone calls, do office hours, that sort of thing. Um, but I, I'd actually pass it over to these guys. They're all mentored. And in fact, we bring our alums back to mentor the other founders. So maybe you can talk about um, what, what you get out of it and what your mentors get out of it. Sure. Um, yeah, we, so there are plenty of people who offered great, great help to us. Um, I'll just pick out a couple. Um, Jay Bornstein was our lead mentor when we were through the program. Um, you know, he's a, he's a professor here. Um, he was a grad student in computer science, just like we were. He started his company sort of not, not really knowing what to do, just like we did. And you know, what was really interesting, I think, was that Stardex is able to pair you I'm not, I think it's because they have 0% equity. It's sort of they don't have an incentive. They're not purchasing mentorship. Right? You, when you find that mentor which, who's exactly was you in your footsteps several years ago and built a successful company, it's, it's a perfect match. You both want to, I, you want to get help from them. They want to help you. Um, and I think when you sort of open it up, you have a 0% equity. You have this, this really interesting dynamic. You get, you get super tailored help and we couldn't have done anything we did without Jay Bornstein's impact and he was he's always been incredible. Yeah, and, and you you've sold your company now and so but you come back and help out other startups founders. Why I do think, you do it? Yeah, a lot of companies will come back and help and I think it's just so tremendous. Even while we were running Wi Fi Slam, um, the minute it was possible or the, as soon as I had tried sort of this mentoring other companies going through the program, I realized I had way more to gain from me like you know, sharing what I'd learned and the lessons I'd learned with them, then perhaps even they have to gain from these lessons themselves. Talk about that. Um, why. Yeah. So, so I'll give you a couple examples. First of all, um, it's really hard to be objective with your own company when it's your baby, when it's something you're working on. You want to get perfect, and you're, you're every hour of the day you're trying to you know while you sleep you're trying to figure things out, and sometimes you just can't think clearly about it. But when you're sitting there, and it's another company, maybe they're not in your domain, maybe they're not. Um, they don't have the same background as you, and you're looking at it, and you're like, but that, that doesn't make sense. Why would a startup, why would you want to do that? And then you walk out of that meeting, and you realize, why, do I, why am I doing what I'm doing? This doesn't make any sense, <laughs> right? Um, but you know, it goes much further than that. I think it's really inspiring. As Stardex continues to raise the bar for people they bring in, um, you know, you'll get to mentor teams that you know, learn lessons that they've learned while they're building their companies. You know, and it helps you too. It's sort of like two basketball stars sort of comparing notes at the All-Star game, right? You, you can't possibly learn everything on your own. And they, as part of the mentorship process, they have to report their progress to you. And sometimes they'll show up and they'll say, hey, we had this really interesting sales tactic. And we went in there and it worked great. And it's worked three times out of four. And you'll say, hey, you know, let me take notes. Like, this is really interesting. <laughs> um, 
And sometimes they'll just inspire you. Like sometimes you're, you know, starting a startup is like a, a roller coaster, as, as I'm sure you've heard a, a thousand times. And, and sometimes it just takes, you know, another team pushing as hard as they can to overcome adversity for you to say, all right, I'm going to strap in, I'm going to do it too. And so it just, I could go on forever, as always. Um, <laughs> what about, what about Milt? You've mentored a lot of... Yeah, so, so, so I learned in life early on that uh, there's nothing free in life. And although that they don't take equity, there, there is a, uh, there's a commitment. <laughs> and the commitment is you're, you're part of the code. And the code is you help out your fellow co-founders. And every, every founder is extremely busy. You, they work 18, 19 hours a day. We, we pull all-nighters there. I haven't pulled all-nighters since medical school. And here I was pulling all-nighter at startups one night. And it's just part of the code. Yet at the same hand, when one of your founders next to you has a problem, and it's something you can help out in, it's your obligation to stop what you're doing and help them. And it is a very interesting culture here, because it, and it works. It works because that's what everyone expects of you when you go there. So they help you and you help them, that's what makes the, 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 the system work. Right, so I had the pleasure of sitting on a board actually with Joseph, right? Yeah, so I remember, and, this, and these are also words of wisdom from Joseph, I will admit this. Um, so it was a company they were presenting and they were getting reamed by all of us. And um, I felt terrible because, I mean, here's a founder, I mean, obviously they're, they're very passionate about what they're doing and we just disagree. And then a comment was made, and this is always stuck with me, it's like, you know, if you tell someone you want to build a rocket ship, no one's going to ask questions. If you tell someone you're going to paint the shed, suddenly everyone's going to be going on about what color. And so that's exactly what was happening. And then you kind of start thinking about, well, wait, I've been in this situation before. When, 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 I've, when, you know, when have I been painting the shed and no one pointed it out to me? So it's, it's, it's moments like that, you know, when you, when you feel like, okay, great, this is, I'm at the right place, and this is, you know, I'm learning just as much as these guys are learning, and I'm really glad to be part of this whole process. And I think Stratix is a good, is a great job of kind of making that happen. Because they take into account, you know, how I've worked in the past, how the other mentors have worked in the past, how we're going to have rapport with the team. And, and having few teams and having alumni that are engaged kind of really makes it easy to make that happen. Um, so I really appreciated that part of it. Yeah, and, and of course, uh, something that's uh, a core staff value and a core value of Stardex is feedback. And constantly getting feedback from people around you, your mentors, your customers, most importantly, um, is essential. Um, so we get a lot of feedback from our mentors. And a lot of what our mentors say, well, one, there's an affinity. Like, this person was me, and so I want to help them. Uh, another is they actually learn a lot. Like, technolo technological innovation is so fast, and there's so much new stuff happening that just by mentoring guys like Joseph, you learn so much. And then a lot of them come to me and say, oh, I learned this, I'm going to bring it back to my company now and talk to my co-founders about it. And so, um, you know, these mentors are there because they want to learn, they want to... Um, they want to help people who are in their shoes. And, and um, you know, there's a lot of people who want to get involved in Stanford, who want to get involved in Stardex just for deal flow, for instance, or just to, like, get stuff out. And we actively vet those people out. And we constantly are getting feedback on them. And so if people, you know, misrepresent something and they are bad actors in this community, then they're out. Are they allowed to invest? If you're a mentor, can you invest? Not during the program. So if, you're active, if you have an active mentor relationship with someone, you can't, as a mentor, you, they actually, they actually like, have to agree to something that says they can't even like, tell the founder they're interested in investing while they're mentoring them. Now, after the program or after the mentorship relationship, we, we allow the founders to make the decision. We say, hey, if you want them as an investor, here's the steps you need to go through to make it an appropriate relationship. And then we warn. If someone's mentoring you, they have inside information that they could use against you in a negotiation. So just be careful about that. Um, and then we are, again, actively evaluating our mentors to make sure that they you know, won't do things like that. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. So I bet there are some questions. Who in the audience would start? Yes. Hi. Um, so hi, Cameron, Joseph, Smith, and Milt. Um, so we were also at my company, Virgins Labs, is also a Stardex alum company. and. Um, yeah, one of the, Stardex, I wanted to say, is very awesome. And one of the things that we got out of it is that we learned, we, at, when we started, we were trying to build um, sort of a lot of similar but different products at the same time. And actually, advice from Cameron helped us focus on making this product, which glasses that can capture your point of view experience. Um, so you know, we've been able to focus, get that manufactured, um, had it even worn by Macklemore, um, you know, got investment from, including from Tim Draper. So. I want to say thank you to Stardex. And also my question is, for companies that are participating in Stardex, what are the recommendations for how to, to learn the most from that experience? 
And then for companies that are StartX alums, um, what are the best ways to give back to the StartX community? Can you just repeat the question? Briefly, yeah, so, briefly. Yeah, the questions are, as a StartX, uh, as a participant in a program like StartX or in StartX, how do you get the most out of it? One. And then two, as an alum or a community member of StartX, how do you continue to get value and contribute value? Do you want a quick Yeah, so I'll answer the first one first. Um, the, the one thing I think um, I tell every founder that enters the program um, that I wish I knew when we started to sort of get as much as you can out of the program is take the time to get to know the other founders in your session. It's really, really easy to be heads down. Like, if you're an entrepreneur, you love working on your startup. And you will do that every day, all the time. And, and it takes a while. You're only in the session for 10, 12 weeks. Um, and that first couple weeks, no one really knows anyone. There's no, they run events, but, but go out of your way to get to know these people. They're all super fantastic. And, and if you do that, you'll get blown away by who they are, and you'll have a better sense of how you can really help them. Everyone is trying to do a lot of stuff. And some things are just really, really easy for you because of your background, and really, really hard for them because of their background. But it doesn't matter, because if you can save them three weeks of time with two hours of your time, it, you, you just create a really, really interesting bond that will last perhaps forever. Yeah. Um, so, Samita, do you want to answer the second question? Um, sure, like how can alumni contribute towards Startex? Um, I think the best way, and we've talked about this already, is mentoring um, and staying in touch with the community, making sure that if there are other companies kind of in the field or somewhat related to you, that you can reach out and make sure that you're helping. Um, but I think overall, generally speaking, time's your worst enemy as a startup. You're always trying to solve problems as quickly as possible. And this kind of, again, touches on Joseph's point, is that you really want to get to know the founders, whether they're alumni or the existing class, to make sure that you're solving problems in a way that you know, other people have already tried it and found an optimal solution. And so that way you can collaborate, make sure that you guys are reaching your goal together, but at the same time making the most of the program. Okay. Hey, you want another question? Yes, Bruce. It, it, it sounds like you're building up an enormous amount of social capital within startups. The startups. That's right. Have you started to track quantitatively um, how startups founded companies or mentored companies are doing versus some of the other incubators in the valley? Uh, Good question. Yeah, so the, the question is, um, how do we quantitatively track the success of our founders and our companies? Um, so again, our, our core metric is what they learn and how what they learn translates to impact in their company. And so we do track that. We track how many skills a founder learns. They, they come and they say, hey, I want to learn what this, I want to learn this list. And then after being ripped apart by alums and mentors, they're like, OK, actually, I need to focus on this list. And then we help them develop those skills. And then we ask them, how, does that, how did that actually impact your company? Now, that's on the nonprofit education side. And, and there, there aren't really other people that are doing that. On the, let's say, against for-profit accelerators, metric is usually funding or average funding per company. Um, our average funding per company is around 2.1 million per company. Uh, that makes us the number two on that metric, which for-profit accelerators use, that makes us number two in the world right behind Y Combinator, ahead of Techstars, 500, um, um, every, uh, you know, uh, other, other accelerators, let's say. Um, and so you know, our companies have raised, I think, 350 million. There's 12 acquisitions. Um, and 85 or 80% so of our companies are still going and funded. 10% have gotten acquired, and 10% have shut down. Um, so in the startup world, that, those are great numbers. Um, and our core thesis is, if we can empower high potential entrepreneurs and help them develop skills to reach their potential, then they'll build successful things. And part of that potential that uh, John was talking about over here was helping them focus, helping them throw stuff away if they need to throw it away. Um, and that, that's all about uh, helping them critically think about the problems they're solving. Terrific. Another question. Yes. Uh, so my question is geared mainly towards Cameron. But I was curious, uh, in the earliest days of StartX, especially while you're a student here, um, what was it like trying to establish these relationships with mentors, entrepreneurs, without really having uh, this tangible metrics to show or much <laughs> substance to really go off of and show off, but yet going to build up a vision? Yeah, so the question is, um, at the very early stages when I was starting, how could I 
what was it like building the network and, and, and building these relationships, relationships for, to build Stardex without anything? And I didn't come from a background where my parents know a lot of people. Um, I was kind of a unit of one. Uh, and so what I did is, is, is the most, one of the most important things when starting a company, which is uh, figure out if you're solving a real problem. Very first thing. And I, with overwhelming evidence, I had identified it was a real problem. You know, 70 founders had uniquely said the same thing, that yes, I did this, and I'm so glad I did this. I wish I had done it sooner, um, but I'm unique. And 70 people said that, so I was like, OK, <laughs> there's a problem here. Um, and so with that problem, then I could craft uh, a solution or a very clear, concise uh, explanation for what I wanted to do and, more importantly, why. And so then when I went to people and explained it, they got it. Like, oh, that makes sense. Here's the data that backs it up. And so they agreed. Now the question is, OK, even if they agree that's a problem, why would they think I can do it? Um, well, that goes into salesmanship and some other things. But basically what I did is what we teach Stardex founders to do. I went to one founder I thought was great. I asked them, who are the other founders you think are great? And they told me five people. I went to all those five people and I said, what other founders do you think are great? What mentors do you think are great? And I went to those you know, five founders and, 25, and five mentors. Um, and then I went to those mentors, talked to them, and said, hey, which mentors do you think are great? And through that, I got warm referrals and connections into hundreds of people. And then you start drawing this kind of mesh network of who thinks who is great. Uh, and then telling people, hey, we're going to do this thing. When it happens, do you want to be involved? And here are the other people who are going to be involved. And so it's kind of like building a marketplace startup where you have, it's kind of chicken and the egg problem. And we had discussions about that week over week. Um, so it was, it was like getting one, getting the other, and using them to get more. Perfect. Another question? Yes. Uh, can you share how many jobs have been created since starting starting? Yeah, so I think. Um, the number, the question. Yeah. Oh, oh, the question is how many jobs have been created? Um, so the last tally was uh, roughly around 500. And so there's, I think that we have a different number now. But it's, it's roughly around the 500 number. I don't know the exact stat right now. So what are your goals going forward? You know, this is, you, you have built something that is incredibly impressive. I oh, mean, I you. remember when this was an <laughs> early seed of an idea. And you were, you know, really um, had a lot of headwinds. You know, when you when you started out, so the, you you've really done an incredibly impressive job, and and clearly, you know, folks appreciate what you've done. What do you see as the goals going? You know, five years down the line. Yeah. So the initial vision of Stardex was there's 40,000 companies that have built at, been built at Stanford. Collectively, they uh, create 2.7 trillion dollars of annual revenue, and that makes it the 10th or 11th world's largest country. Um, the people who are the most successful leverage the group around them to be more successful. So the core vision of Stardex was if, in the past, all those 40,000 people or companies were helping each other, they could have created a lot more impact. So the next step with Stardex is saying, OK, well, if we can leverage the entire Stanford Entrepreneurial Network to help itself, that could materially in increase and improve um, both the skill development, the access to information, and the access to people. Um, so right now, we've supported people five years out of school, a couple people like Milt. Um, we've had a CS professor uh, go through the program, Monica Lamb, a bunch of medical school professors. And so the idea is, OK, well, let's take this from, from this specific stage we're at of really supporting companies in this extended community to really helping the entire Stanford alumni entrepreneurial community, getting value, providing them value, getting value from them for the other founders, um, and then use that as a test case to potentially go to other universities. Um, and so, or be a model other people can replicate. Now, there's a lot of universities from Harvard, MIT, to other places who have called us, reached out to us, and tried to replicate components. Um, and yeah, just like the epicenter is trying to create more entrepreneurial engineers all over the world and all over the country, we'd love to provide a platform to, for universities and ecosystems to have a structured way for networks to help themselves. Terrific. Question, yes. You mentioned real world um, solutions to problems and such. So it's not technology for technology's sake, but creating maybe a solution, for instance, on something as big as global warming and such. Um, I know that's huge. But um, so, what type of criteria are you looking for outside of just the engineer? 
come in with with an idea to to develop that's going to really create a real real world solution. Can I, can I jump in there? Uh, my carbon light house. Well, so <laughs> so. Can you repeat the question? Oh. Uh, Okay, sounds like the question was, what criteria are there to make sure people are solving big problems for the world? Um, and, and I just wanted, you know, when we were in there, we were the second session, I, I think they, they didn't have nearly as much uh, leverage to sort of bring in great entrepreneurs, but even us, you know, going through our session, to our left was a company who had, you know, found a way to transform skin cells into beating heart cells so that they could do you know, live screening of, of drugs and things. On my right was a company who had drastically transformed the economics for solar heliostat technology using AI and robotics. And, and I mean, you know, here we are, we're just doing indoor positioning for smartphones. Like, we're the ones that, like, really? Um, and, and I think it's just inspiring. When you sit beside these people, you ask yourself, hey, could I be doing something greater too? I think everyone motivates everybody. And so maybe it's not just the criteria, maybe it's just the environment. Mm -hmm. And I just want to reemphasize what Cameron said earlier about startups. In terms of picking companies, they don't really look at the idea so much. It's really about the team because what you find out is it's all about um, pivoting. I mean, so many ideas. I mean, I was in my very first company and we started one direction. And within a year, we were in a completely different direction. And we ended up being very successful. But it's not necessarily about the idea. It's about the people getting together and leveraging the thinking process. And a bunch of smart people that work really hard, it's amazing how successful they can be together if they're working collaboratively. Back there. Speak up really loud. Uh, how much cross-pollination is there between teams? Uh, like, do you recruit people from other teams that are not doing as well into your company and vice versa? Do you lose numbers if you're struggling to other teams that are doing better? Uh, sure. I, the question was, how much cross-pollination is there between teams? Um, are teams recruiting from each other? I guess, is that fair, fair representation? Yeah. Um, so, so like, you know, I think the common theme for the whole night has been startups accepts great founders and you have people of great caliber who are coming in who want to work on great ideas. Um, there is, there's generally, again, you know, like, good you know, rule of thumb that you could basically say that, you know, obviously you don't go out there and steal anyone else's employees. But teams break apart sometimes and, you know, things don't work out. And startups is a great place there to kind of find where you want to fall, fall into. Um, so, for example, for us, um, when I first went to Startix, I was actually working with someone else, and we ended up not working together. And similarly, my, now my co-founder was working with someone else, and they also didn't end up working together. And which is, again, having an environment like Startix, which is very <coughs> safe and supportive, it's perfectly fine to experiment and things don't work out, and you move on. Um, Charles and I ended up working together on Spot On, and it was great. I mean, at that point in time, it just clicked, it made sense. Um, we were like, we're supposed to be co-founders, and now we can move on. So in that way, it is partially true um, that it does create relationships where they wouldn't have been otherwise. Yeah, so the, uh, one of the core things we focus on is reducing the barrier for people to help each other. And that's trust. And so we have certain community norms around you know, not poaching employees right. and, and not doing things that are shady again. Um, but then we also spend a lot of time building trusted relationships between the founders and creating rules around engagement. And what that does is it, it allows us, we actually, one session went from 15 to 30 companies and the work for the staff went down. It's like, oh, interesting. And it went down because we focus on providing uh, mechanisms for founders to teach each other and reducing the barrier. And so yeah, the core value we provide is creating trust between founders so they can help each other. Yes. Um, do you know what the breakdown is of participants coming from STEM backgrounds versus softer humanities backgrounds? Um, that get into the program or that apply? So, oh. yeah, so, so I'm not sure about the applicants. Um, we definitely have way more, way more STEM backgrounds than humanities. And that's, we also have way more STEM people apply. Um, and we don't really look at people's backgrounds as a, as a let's say, um, we do look at people's entrepreneurial backgrounds. Have they, built, have they tackled hard problems before? Have they tried to solve some inefficiency just out of their pure you know, frustration with it? Um, but you know, there's, we haven't had as many uh, soft majors go through the program. We definitely have had some. We've had some people, like there was one founder who um, was building a company, kind of like a mint.com, but for um, um, for minorities, um, instead of using a web platform, using cell phone, just texting. 
Um, but yeah, we've had them, but definitely not, definitely not as much. Another question? Yes. One question is, you said Stanford doesn't take any equity. How does a, is there any licensing deals, you know, with Stanford? Um, I mean, if, to some extent, yeah. So I th the question you asked is, does Stardex doesn't take any equity? And you're asking if there's any licensing deals with Stanford? Is that the question? Yeah, based on the yield and whatever. Is the question whether Stanford has any IP interest in this? Yes. Okay, yeah, so Stardex is a legally separate entity from Stanford. And so um, there's no issues with licensing, and we don't take any IP. So if, if a PhD does research at Stanford and uses material resources, Stanford, independent of Stardex, owns a part of that IP. Um, and so that's kind of an independent process from Stardex. Yes? It would be interesting to hear from each of you if there's a single personality trait that attributes to a funder's success. Hmm. So the question is, is there any personality trait that you've seen uh, contributes to the success of a founder? So, so Tom Stenison was asked once, uh, it took him about a thousand times to figure out how to make a light bulb, and he didn't say he failed 999 times, he said he learned 999 times how not to, to build a light bulb. And I think that's really what's key about entrepreneurs, if there's one thing that you have to be able to deal with failure, because that's what, that's what the whole learning process is about. And, and I think that's what the support of a place like Stardex offers for you. Um, as somebody mentioned earlier, um, you know, entrepreneurs and startup companies are roller coasters, and you're going to spend a lot more time on the downside of that roller coaster going than it seems like you're on the upside. So I would say if there's one thing I would say about it, and this comes from being a venture capitalist and being in startup companies myself, is there just has to be perseverance. I think that's the one overriding uh, characteristic. Um, so I think this might be a little bit more uh, random, but I think for me the most valuable characteristic was empathy. I never thought this would be important coming into doing a startup. But I think it's been incredibly helpful when it's come to recruiting, to finding investors, to finding my co-founder and keeping relationships. Um, startups are very rocky. And what that ends up doing is it ends up uh, making you question you know, the kind of decisions you're making and who you're working with. And having empathy at those points of time and not really pointing fingers and taking a step back and um, talking through things can be very helpful and instrumental towards making sure that grow this thing out before beating it to death in the beginning. Hmm. Yeah, perseverance and empathy are far and away my number one and two. Same reasons. <laughs> I think I have a, a slight um, um, variation of that, which is, I actually, it's kind of like, it is, it's, it, it's that. It's the combination of perseverance and empathy. What I was thinking is, as a founder, you have to be okay taking risks and failing and thinking of that as learning, just like Milt said. Um, and you have to have this, I, I call it humble confidence. And it, it's, a, it's, this, it's this trait where you're strong and you, could, you can inspire people to follow you um, because you, you're not afraid of, of making tough decisions or taking risks, but at the same time you're constantly listening and you're constantly trying to learn and become better and using every single opportunity and interaction to learn something. And so you're both humble and extremely confident. On that note, we're going to have to call this to a close. But I, please join me in thanking this fabulous panel.